all of this in here, there is nothing special or new or anything you can't just find through a Google search. The thing, particularly with locks, is locksmiths have this old guild mentality that the information should stay secret within the guild, that once you become a locksmith, you should not tell anybody else outside of locksmiths. It's like magicians. You know, they want to keep their secrets within the guild. This tends to actually work against security because you go in and you don't know any better. You, know, you try to buy, you, know, you go into to Home Depot and buy a lock and assume that, oh, it's a lock. You know, let's keep people out. Well, as you'll see, there's some absolute shite out there. People are passing off as security devices when it's not. Who am I? Consultant, author, trainer, hacker, researcher, onto locks. Why do they matter? So you've got all of this expensive networking gear. You've spent a whole bunch of money on firewalls and that to keep intruders out. But if I can walk in with a console cable and plug in, you're screwed. You know, the telco closet. If I can walk in and just hook a couple of clip leads on, I can listen to your phone calls. All the security goes out the window. All your hard work here in the data center can get undermined by a trip to Home Depot. That's why these things matter. You'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on digital assets and protect them with a $5 lock from Home Depot. The lowest grade of lock is your standard pin tumbler lock. Everybody sees these, everybody's got, I mean, whoever's doing the video left, you know, all of his keys up here, they're all pin tumbler locks. You see these things everywhere. Padlocks, doorknobs, deadbolts. But most people don't understand how these things work. You know, all they see is where you put the key in and they, you know, the little, I don't know, the, a pin there. That's all they know. When you actually look in this, there's what they call a pin stack. Try to turn the thing without the key and, you know, the top pin binds. The plug here can't turn. In order to allow the lock to turn, you have to raise the, the bottom pin and the top pin to where this lines up with the plug, which is called the shear line, and allows the lock to turn. So you can have a row of these pins in a lock. The key goes in, pushes them all up to the right level, and the lock turns. You know, pretty simple. It's been working for us for the past, you know, 150 odd years. Cutaway lock, you can see the springs of the top, the top pins here. But most people think that these things are manufactured um, really, really well. What they figure is that all of these uh, pin chambers are drilled in a nice straight line. And so when you put a little tension on the plug, you know, the, this piece here that turns, they all bind equally. They all you know, jam at the same time. Well, that's not quite true because drill bits wear, machinery is a little bit off. The holes um, get drilled a little bit, you know, cockeyed, this is a little exaggerated. But basically what ends up happening is only one pin binds at a time. This allows you to push the plug around just a little bit, just adding a little bit of tension, which is what you do here, and then lift the bottom pin until you feel a little kind of click where it kicks over just that little bit extra until where the next pin binds. So what ends up happening is you put tension on with the tension wrench, you reach in, and you're testing all the pins. Oh, you feel that one's sticking a bit, it's binding, so that you know, it kicks over a little bit. Oh, there's the next one. Find it, kicks over a little bit more, find it there, you know, and so on and so forth, until you get to the last one, at which point it opens. It's that simple. Now, the trick is when you're picking a lock, it's like going to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. Just because you know how to do it doesn't mean it's you know, that easy, but you'd be surprised. Another technique is called raking, using a tool typically called a snake. You're basically going in and just kind of jiggling around, pushing the pins around. You're basically approximating dozens of keys at any given moment and hoping that you get the right combination. This can actually work very well and very quickly to the point where you can open a lock faster than you can probably dig the key out of your pocket. Wafer locks are another type of lock that you probably run into a lot. You typically see these on desk drawers, cabinets, and you know, really low security situations. You look at these ones and you'll usually see it's square. It's not a, a pin that sticks down, it's a square. Inside of these is a very simple mechanism. It's just a spring-loaded wafer. You push it too high or it sits too low and the lock won't open. So you have to have a key that lifts this wafer to the right height. And you know the holes can be at different levels depending on the, the bumps on the key. With those types of locks, breaking and jiggling work just as well. You're hoping to find that spot where everything lines up. Same principles with the pin tumbler lock. You can turn it a little bit and kind of feel that, you know, when that edge kicks over and it, it finds it's where it wants to be. Shimming. How many of you use this kind of master padlock? These things are as effective as putting in a do not disturb sign. Take a beer can, cut out a template. There's this little finger, essentially, that you end up sliding down the edge of the shackle. 
Now what happens inside is you've got the shackle comes down in, into the body of the lock. And there's a little, the little notch in it. And a lever comes out and grabs onto that. So that's what keeps it from coming out. Because you want to be able to just you know, close your locker quickly, you know, slap it shut, that thing is spring-loaded. That lever is spring-loaded. So what you're doing is you're effectively sliding this finger down on the outside, then spinning it around, which pushes that lever back out of the way because it's spring-loaded. And of course, there's nothing holding the shackle closed, so it pops open. Bumping just takes advantage of physics. Same operation as a pick gun. If you've ever had to call a locksmith to open up your house, they've probably pulled out one of these or an electric version. All you're doing is you're hitting the bottom pins all in a straight line, kicks all the top pins up at the same time, and if you just apply tension at just the right moment, both plug spins. It seems so simple. I mean, you know, a locksmith comes out and, and charges you 70 bucks for you know, something that takes him a few seconds. It seems magical because most people don't understand what's going on internally here. They're just seeing, you know, magical tool. Now, we can take that same principle and apply it to an ordinary key. Essentially, you take a key, cut it down to the lowest bidding for each of the pin chambers, and put it in the lock. But essentially, you just put this key in the lock, whack it with a hammer, because it's making contact with all the pins at the same time, it just kicks them all up, a nice wide shear line, apply tension at the right time, away it goes. If somebody is looking to you know, break in, when they know you've got a crappy lock and it's a, a wiser keyway, well, let's get a wiser blank and cut it down and away you go. Where are these locks typically used? There's one down there, utility panel. There's one on this nice big power off panel. Maybe you don't want to you know, pull the plug on the data center in it. Sensitive wiring, like for an alarm system. Why are these locks so bad? The ANSI standards don't cover covert security ratings at all. It's basically how hard can I hit this with a sledgehammer or that kind of stuff. They're not thinking professional surreptitious entry. America's Society for Testing Materials. The toughest rating they have is only 15 minutes. And that's typically going at it with a grinder. Many times picking is pretty much instantaneous. If you've got something really sensitive, a lock is not going to keep somebody out. If they've got hours and hours and hours to pick away at this thing, it's just a matter of time before they do. Typically, what you'll have is, say, a security guard that comes around every 15 minutes. Well, if you know that the lock will take half an hour to open, and the security guard comes around every 15 minutes, okay, it's good enough. Let's go for a, a step up here and look at pick-resistant locks. Now, the keyway is this profile that the key fits into. Really simple ones, you know, wisers, schlags you see on so many doors are straight and wide, really easy to get tools in. Other models, they get more narrow, there's extra wards, you know, pieces that stick out that get in the way. You can get really complex where it's almost impossible to get a straight angle on individual pins. Now, obviously, this makes the key thinner, it can break easier, this costs more because it takes more effort to mill, and you can get really insane ones. Typically, you're paying a lot more for these because the manufacturer has a patent on a specific design and is enforcing those patents. Unshimmable padlocks. The cheap master lock has the spring-loaded mechanism just so you can just slap it shut. With these, you'll have a double ball bearing. So you've got the center shaft here, which has two cutouts. When it's locked, well, those cutouts are, are rotated away, and so the balls are pushed into you know, the, the little cutouts of the shackle. There's no way you're opening that, because physically the balls cannot go anywhere. So it might as well just be a solid piece of metal. But you rotate this center plug, and those balls can now fall in, shackle moves freely. With these, typically they'll also be key retaining, which means that because you have to rotate that plug back to lock it, they'll hold on to the key so that you, know, you can't just leave this thing wide open, which is good or bad depending on you know, the circumstances. But these things, you can't get anything down there because you physically cannot push that ball bearing away from anything. There's nowhere for it to go. So these sort of things, yeah, they're worth the extra money. Pick resistant pins is something else to look for. In this case, you, know, you see the spool pin, you see how it operates. It, catches on this edge when you push up, you put tension on it, and it makes it really difficult to tell if you're at the shear line or if you just caught on that edge. Up until, I'd say in the last year and a half, um, you'd be very hard pressed to find any security pins in any lock at like a Canadian Tire or Home Depot. You might find one with like a single spool pin in it or something like that, but that's still not a massive deterrent. They just cost more because it's not a case of just taking a piece of brass rod and cutting it. It's you now actually have to machine these things down. Again, costs go up. Mushroom pins are another type. Serrated, you can imagine all the little edges that things can catch on. You can get really exotic, have serrated bottom pins, combinations. I mean, you can imagine how nasty this would be to try to pick because there's just so many things that it can catch and, and just give you false feedback. Another technique is called top gapping. 
The top pins are actually tapered. The pin chamber are tapered as well. The top pins don't drop all the way down into the plug, but it gets this gap. So if you use something like a bump key and hit it, because there's not a uniform distance between them, they all hit at different times, it's not going to pass the force up equally. Anti-bump driver pin, because this pin is now lighter and the spring tension is different, it's going to react differently as well. Kind of eye-opening for me because I, I first heard about bumping maybe, I'd say about five or six years ago uh, at a conference in New York. And I had actually found a locksmith book in the Edmonton Public Library from 1993, I think it was, that actually, actually describes the technique of bumping a lock with a modified key. And so this information was sitting around within locksmith hands for the better part of, what, 10 years or more? You know, how long have thieves potentially had this and people have not known and not known to demand locks that can uh, do this? At DEF CON two years ago, I believe it was, they taught an 11-year-old girl to bump open high security locks with, you know, that technique. Anybody can do this, and it just takes, you know, modifying a regular key. So if you have a key that fits in that lock, you just have to get out a file and whittle it down to the right level, and away you go. High security locks. Schlag Everest was the first real attempt at a higher security lock on the, the mass market. They've got this little check pin, additional pin at the bottom, that needs to be lifted by a very specialized key. This is looking from the bottom. If this little nub here isn't pushed by the key up into plug, there's no way that, you know, that thing's going to turn key has this special little notch in it that grabs and lifts that pin. So if you have a key that fits that key wave but doesn't have that notch, well, you know, you're not going to be able to pull that pin out of the way and it's not going to work. And it's just one other thing that you have to try to pick and you know, it's just more, it makes it much more difficult. The problem was, because all of those check pins were the same for all locks, and all you had to do was just lift it out of the way, they built a special wrench that just reaches down into the lock lifts that pin, apply your force, and pick as normal. We could just take a normal key, cut off everything else except that little bottom channel that we need, stick that in the lock, and use that as a tension wrench. Sidebars have been around for quite a while, but usually only in the most expensive locks. Only recently do you start seeing these in any sort of lower-end applications. Essentially, it's an additional pin stack in the side that fits into the, the side of the plug that gets activated by the key. So you've essentially got like twice the number of pins to deal with. The Asa Twin uses these additional cuts which interact with this second set of pins. You can't just go to Home Depot and get these made. You have to go to a locksmith who has to be licensed by ASA to make these keys, which means they're not gonna hand them out willy-nilly. The problem was these keys are geographically restricted. Rather than everybody gets a different bidding on this special sidebar cutting there, everybody in a region gets the same one. Berlin, all the locksmiths in Berlin have the same bidding. Because you've got that uniformity, if you can get a key, you know, coded for Berlin area, you can then use that to defeat this piece and actually turn the rest of this thing into a pump key. Schlag Primus is another one where it uses five finger pins in the side. That's another method that other locks are starting to use. And you can see this key has, you know, an additional set of bidding on the side. If you can get change key for the building that has the same one, then you can use that. But otherwise, you'd have to pick all these individually, which is a right pain in the ass. Tiny, tiny engineering that's in these things it makes you realize that uh, a lot of work's gone into these things to come up with these mechanisms. I mean, some of this is brilliant. I'm personally a fan of uh, slider locks. I actually have a, a variant of this on my front door. What it is is there's these little worm cuts on the side of the key. So you've got a normal pin stack, you know, it's got pick resistant pins, all that stuff. But the slider activates side pins, and there's no springs here. So there's nothing to give you feedback as to when things actually click into place. And you've also got little false cuts here on the top and bottom of these side pins. You'll be sitting there, you'll, you'll lift it, and it, it'll go in a little bit, but it's tough to tell if it's a false cut, if it's a real cut. You're probably never going to pick one of these manually um, in a, a real-world situation. Rotating pins. The bottom pin has a groove cut in it. When you put it in, rotates the pin to the right angle to allow that sidebar to fall in. There's actually different angled cuts. Rotating disc locks. These ones I really like. Similar principles to a safe lock where you've got rotating discs that have to line up in a, a certain order. Very, very difficult to pick. Specialized tools are required to this. The two-in-one tool here, basically you slide it in, you use this piece here to, to rotate the disc, and the markings here tell you exactly which disc you're interacting with. But the highest grade 
dare we say unpickable because that's always subject to change, so put that little caveat there. Abloy Protec, these things are awesome. It is a type of disc lock, but it's got all sorts of false cuts on it, so if you are trying to pick it, you can't tell which is the real ones, which is the fake. And also the way that the key works, you can't use that two-in-one tool that you don't actually have access to a shaft down there that you can interact with. I mean, you can see the amount of parts that are inside there. All these little false cuts and everything that are going on there. These are kind of cool. Miwa, key with an arrangement of magnets instead of pins. Now, these have a north-south orientation. So you put the key in, it's either north or a south pole at the top of the pin, and that either pushes or pulls pins out of the way until it turns. Of course, when you pull it out, it scatters everything and relocks the lock. The EVA MCS takes this even further. These magnets are not just like a top is north, the bottom is south. This side will be north, this side will be south, and they're actually rotated. Like each one of these, the north and south, is at a different orientation. It's using magnetism to rotate tumblers into the right place. You, you can see here that when you're putting the lock in, all these little notches for the sidebar you know, they're all scattered, but when you put it in, they all line up nice and straight, and it opens. Multi-lock has an interactive unit, which basically there's a little ball. When you put it in, you physically cannot get in and reach around to push a check pin. But this ball, because it's floating inside the key, travels along and then gets pushed up. The, the best advice that I've ever heard was actually from Matt Blaze. His answer to, you know, what lock should I put on the front door of my house? And it's like one that's slightly better than your neighbor's. Safes. Most of the safes, you know, you see it like Walmart or Costco or something like that, they're basically what we call fire safes. They're meant for, you know, copies of, of paperwork. They're meant for, you know, if your house catches fire, it's supposed to protect critical documents. But they're not burglary rated safes. A proper safe lock looks, you know, like this. It's big, metal, heavy. These can still be manipulated. This is a, a robotic uh, auto dialer where it basically sits there and goes brute forces all the possible combinations. We hook this thing up and leave it for, you know, 24 hours and eventually it will get the combination. Now where it gets really interesting is when you get companies like Kaba, this is a safe lock. You notice LCD. Every time you open this thing, the starting position changes. So you can't just sit there and watch the person and see how many times they turn it to the left and to the right. And it also changes which direction you have to start on. And this LCD, you can only see if you've got your head right over top of it. So you can't, you know, look at it from an oblique angle. I mean, these things obviously cost you a lot more, but the other thing that they also do is they look at the behavior of you turning the lock. If you use one of those robotic auto dialers, a human can't, you know, turn their wrist twice continuously. It's gonna say, whoa, there's something funky going on here. If you put a robotic auto dialer on there, typically it's going as fast as it can. Well, it knows how fast a human can spin the thing. If it spins faster, bolts go out. It's actually powered by the motion. What about destructive entry? This is your, your typical image of a burglar. Pry bar trying to get in your windows. The old brick through a window. Drill out all the pins. You can drill out safes. The neat thing with that is that you know something happened. If somebody comes along with bolt cutters, cuts the lock and leaves the thing there, or you know, drills it out or smashes a window, there's evidence there that something happened, somebody did something. If you leave your door unlocked, your insurance company's gonna say, well, that's your fault, you know, not ours. And your liability changes. You know, the reason you bought insurance they could find a way out. Having a higher security lock makes them throw the brick through the window or do something more obvious. Whereas if they just picked it, and they can do that in five seconds, it's a lot harder to plead that case. The scariest risk is the non-destructive entry. How do you know if that door's been opened or not, if somebody's been in there? You know, how do you know that what you left in there is still there? So you use different locks for different purposes. Really basic, cheap, Home Depot pad lock. You know, an unskilled attacker, basic tools and techniques, under five minutes, a skilled attacker, same thing. More resistant locks, usually tighter keyway in this case, you know, it's, it's upside down, it's really thin, there get tools in there as easily. There's no way in hell you're getting a shim in there or anything, it's a ball bearing system. Bump resistant, an unskilled attacker, probably take them more than five minutes. However, a skilled attacker could probably still do it in five minutes. If it... High security locks, pick resistant pins in them, shrouds so you can't get anything in there to try to shim, but it's also got the ball bearings, so that won't allow you to shim. An unskilled attacker, there's no way in hell they're opening this in less than 30 minutes. That's, you know, getting out the angle grinder and trying to saw through the middle of the thing. Of course, that's a lot of material and it's hardened. Skilled attacker, depending on the lock, there are some specialized techniques they could use. Might get them in, in five minutes. And the, quote, unpickable locks. Usually these things, you know, they're well shackled, they're solid. An unskilled attacker is pretty much screwed. But, skilled attacker, if they know what they're doing, 
30 minutes. I actually have an interesting lock here, what one would consider a high security lock, but has a horrible failing that allows a denial of service condition, essentially. Where do you get these locks? Home Depot, higher security ones at a locksmith, and the really secure ones you can typically order online. A lot of the stuff you get over here, like a locksmith will have a certain brand that's local, but if you get something really exotic from Europe or Asia, nobody over here is gonna be able to figure this thing out. You use the cheap lock on your garden shed, you know, protecting your lawnmower. Better locks, you know, maybe your front door. On your front door, you're typically home, you know, in a lot of evenings. That acts as a deterrent, you know, you got somebody in the house. They could come around in the middle of the day, but also if it's on your front door, people are gonna be able to see them. Thieves are, are chicken, they don't like exposure. Now on your back door, if it's you know, surrounded by bushes or something, you might want to have a higher security lock. Storage area is not you want to use definitely a higher security lock because it's left unattended for very long periods of time. You've got a cabin, very isolated. And the really high security stuff you want to keep on anything really dangerous or really important in this case, a gun cabinet. Protecting against these, really there's external access, internal access, sensitive areas. Where do you want to use these type of locks? You don't ever want to use this shitty lock. If you paid two bucks for the lock, that should tell you something about you know, the manufacturing tolerances and everything. For the most part, external access, you want to use a high security lock, also because it will put up with the environmental crap. It can be wailed on with like a sledgehammer. A lot of times these things are hardened against that. Internal offices, protecting privacy, supplies, you know, things are really important because it's indoors and you can theoretically have guards and just other people around. A pick resistant lock can make sense there. The really high security stuff, you want to have server racks, network equipment. Basically, if you can hold 100 grand worth of gear in your arms, you probably want to use this. It's worth 50 or 70 or 100 bucks for this lock. Pretty much anything you can get fired over, you probably want to use one of these. A proper lock should not be able to be compromised in an easy way. It should also leave behind clear signs of tampering. If the guy, you know, takes a sledgehammer and has to go through the door, but the lock is still intact, well, okay, you know what happened. With normal use, certain wear occurs, but with a pick because it's reaching around into places that you know a key ordinarily wouldn't touch. It leaves distinctive marks. However, convincing your insurance company to go to the level of macro photography to analyze that can be tricky. Picking leaves these big gashes. That one's been picked to hell, but it can be done with the right tools and the right finesse with next to no evidence. Sides of pins, the very back of the lock where a key never would touch leaves gouges. The very end of the lock can be scratched. A bump key, it's going and it's making contact in specific spots. You're usually hitting it hard and leaving big flat spots. Also a note, if you do want to get into picking, don't pick any lock that's actually in service because there's a chance that you could screw it up, you know, crush a pin or something like that. So if you're doing this on your front door, you could lock yourself out forever. If you think a lock has been picked and compromised, don't tamper with it. Call an investigator, somebody who is you know, licensed and trained in this stuff for forensics. Having newer locks matters because as locks get older, the tolerances get sloppier from wear and tear. Makes it easier to pick. So if you refresh your locks every couple of years, you make sure also that there aren't extra keys wandering around. And security's only effective as the people behind it. Blackbag.nl. This guy, Barry, is a friend of mine. He's the man for lock picking. He actually has this tool that you basically slide underneath the door, flip it up, and it grabs onto the handle because all the accessibility laws state, you know, if you don't have hands, you need to be able to open the door. So it's, you know, you've got to push down on the, the lever. You can't have like a turning doorknob. So all this thing does is goes under the door, flips up, grabs onto the thing, and pulls it down. You have this big expensive lock there, and well, you know, you just reach under the door and, and open the thing from the inside. Physical security has so many facets. This was just sort of the quick fire hose primer to you guys to hopefully realize that there's this whole other world out there that you know, needs to be uh, dealt with. And unfortunately, the information is not always as accessible as it should be because you've got this old guild mentality and everybody thinks, oh, this is burglar tactics. I'm like, no, this is protecting yourself. You know, if I'm using a really crappy lock and I'm wondering why people keep stealing my stuff out of the gym locker, well, maybe you know, I should know that I should maybe not go to Home Depot to replace it and go to a locksmith and get a real lock. There was a, a wonderful article in Wired just recently about a guy they busted uh, out of Winnipeg who was, had this, this brilliance to be able to spot security vulnerabilities and made quite the life of crime, right down to finding banks that were being constructed. Nobody was really guarding the building while it was under construction. There was no money there. Would go in and actually construct little spaces that he could hide in and built himself in these back doors to you know, clean them out. An absolutely amazing story, and I swear, just looking at pictures of him, I've met him somewhere at some time. I, I don't, I can't place where, but I think uh, next talk's coming around pretty quick, so, uh, I don't know. Yeah.
what that pin does is it prevents you from you know, rotating the thing. That's what holds that thing in. So if you take that out, and somebody comes up with a key, goes to open it, you're going to over-rotate it. Or more correctly, what happens if they um, go to put it on later, like they leave it open. They, they um, come back, you know, put the key in, close it. When they go to turn it, they can overturn it. And when they pull it out, it dumps the entire core out. All the pins and springs and everything. And you just reach over the screwdriver and just flip the cam to, to open this thing. So, I mean, this is a nice, you know, strong, well-built, ball bearings. Uh, nice, you know, uh, like six pins. Security pins in the thing, but it fails horribly, you know, open. So it, it's it just became this really odd example because within 30 seconds of having it out of the package, I dumped all the pins across the table at the sushi bar we were at. Yes, it's true. It's heavy.